everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and welcome back to another blood-curdling episode of That Time on Murder, She Wrote. Today I'm talking about a special episode. This series focuses on J.B. Fletcher, a writer-turned-amateur sleuth who helps bumbling detectives solve homicide cases, but in this one, Jessica doesn't feature at all. Instead, this story takes place in London, and the protagonist is now her British cousin, Emma McGill, a flashy theater actress with red hair and a hammy accent. Poison? Oh, good lord. And he suspects me! Well, Bob's your uncle. Jessica's family tree has always been a little sketchy. It seems like she has a million family members, particularly cousins, nieces, and nephews, but Emma is at least recurring. She was introduced in the second season, where Jess helped her evade murder, but in this episode we only see Emma, who is now the one in the gumshoe role, and is appropriately titled It Runs in the Family. I can't wait to rewatch this one because I adore Lansbury's goofy performance as Emma. She's so extra. It reminds me of when she played Mrs. Lovett in the morbid musical Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. Lansbury did a lot of theater work throughout her career, particularly musicals, and that style of acting definitely leaks into her performance as Emma. We even get a song! I'll you like to spoon with me? Oh! As we begin the episode, we are presented with Emma and her friends sharing a pint and reminiscing at a pub. Emma's career in musical theater is immediately established by her friends, who ask her if she'd consider getting back on stage to sing. All oh, this voice isn't what it used to be. It's got more cracks than an old teapot. Oh, does it now? By the way, did you see that thread on Twitter about Angela Lansbury as teapots? Classic. Emma is approached by a man telling her he needs to speak with her and that it's urgent. Anything for you, Mr. Belvedere. Turns out a very old friend of hers, a man she once had a romantic attraction to, wants to see her. He's now the 18th Viscount Black Raven. I'm just kind of shrugging in American right now because I have no idea what any of that means, but it sounds badass. The Viscount, whose name is Jeffrey, also sent along a thousand pounds, and Emma is insulted he would try to bribe her to visit, but Humphrey, the family solicitor, said it was in case she didn't remember. He also just randomly drops this bomb on her. The Viscount is dying. Oh, bugger. Humphrey takes her up to the mansion the next morning, where she starts to get nervous. Well, I'm not exactly 19 anymore now, am I? And the Viscount isn't exactly 22 but I would tap both of you. Time to meet the family. First we have Jeffrey's sister Sybil, who seems reserved and not thrilled to see Emma, followed by meeting his grandnephew. Is that Sting? Neither him or his mother Pauline give any fucks about meeting Emma. Derek, who is not Sting, runs off in a huff. I don't want to be rich. Don't stand so close to me. Emma goes up to see her old friend, and they are over the moon to see each other again. It's actually a really sweet scene, with two old friends rekindling their spark and reflecting on the past. Jeffrey tells her he just wanted to see her one last time before he passes in a few months, and that he also wants to give her a house with some income after he dies. My, my, they must have had quite the fling for him to want to give her an entire house. <sighs> This is so wholesome. Meanwhile, Jeffrey's nephew, Arthur, and his wife, Pauline, chat before dinner. Pauline seems to hate the fact that Arthur isn't taking becoming the 19th Viscount more seriously because it would give them a lot of notoriety, but he's really not into it. She's also not jazzed that Jeffrey is gifting a house to Emma. Good lord. Nice pun. Jeffrey's other nephew, Johnny, also returns home, bringing his lady friend with him. Jane leaves. You probably recognize her from her role as Daphne in Frasier. This is one of her first television appearances. The family decides they don't like her, labeling her cheap and obvious. They also dislike Emma, referring to her in the same way. Emma picks at her pickled herring, saying she would like to eat it, but had a terrible case of food poisoning caused by it many years ago. Jeffrey understands and eats her portion. A little more for me. Food poisoning sounds lovely, YOLO! After dinner, Pauline beguiles everyone with her... questionable piano skills. <laughs> this reaction is perfect! Somebody meme that! Love it. The Count is like, yes, yes, but maybe someone with talent can entertain us now, and suggests Emma sing a song she used to perform while she was acting. I am so excited! I love it when Lansbury sings. Angela Lansbury fact! Did you know she recorded Beauty and the Beast from the Disney film of the same name in one take after being up all night traveling? Nailed it. Em starts playing a very beautiful song, but Jeffrey is like, no, no, play the other one. She hesitates briefly, then goes into this little ditty. How would you like to spoon with me? Wow, I really thought Sybil was about to literally clutch her pearls. Jeffrey is all about it, though. How would you like to spoon with me? I would. 
Jeffrey, you hound! This is really such a treat because Lansbury originally sang this song in the 1946 film Till the Clouds Roll By. How'd you like to spoon with me? I'd like to. How'd you like to spoon with me? Well, Rob. Sit beneath an oak tree, large and shady. How'd you like to spoon with me? I'm a diver. Oh, that woman! Shut up, Karen. Go back to cowering in your shoulder pads. Arthur really liked the performance, but Pauline blows a gasket, telling him that Emma won't be getting anything from their family. Over my dead body does she get anything out of this family. Now, ever. Is that Rod Stewart? The family doctor does a routine checkup on Jeffrey, and he is pleasantly surprised to find that he's doing much better. Much to the annoyance of his greedy family, it seems that Jeffrey has another 20 years ahead of him. Of course, it's Emma who has revived him, and he plans to celebrate this new feeling by taking her out on a picnic. On their way there, he tells her that his father, the 17th Viscount Black Raven, had died just a couple months ago. Huh. Weird coincidence. Jeffrey's selfish family is fuming that Emma has basically extended his life. They want him dead sooner than later so somebody can be the next Viscount, even though the person next in line doesn't really care. Humphrey feels good about bringing the two together because he feels like he thwarted their relationship many years ago when he insisted Jeffrey leave London, so he refuses to break it apart. Jeffrey's sister threatens to expose him, saying she knew he was feeding the 17th Viscount whiskey and chocolate, potentially leading to his death. You know, if you want to compare this to something more modern, this is very similar to Knives Out. There's a will or inheritance on the line, and the characters make up this selfish cutthroat family who care more about social status than someone's well-being. It makes sense that modern mysteries still use these themes. They've been used in mystery stories since... forever. It's a tale as old as time. So... this guy is dead? No! No! Ugh, no! I wanted this love story to work out! While he was on the picnic with Emma, Jeffrey just kind of keeled over. Emma drives off to get help, but it's too late. The doctor thinks it was a heart attack, but the detective suspects foul play and demands an autopsy. The inspector is insulted, claiming that this was the Viscount Black Raven. I don't care if he was the bleeding Duke of York. <gasps> Gasp! Poor Emma, I feel so terrible for her. She's the only one genuinely sad about Jeffrey's death. Everyone else is pretty chill about it, as you can expect. Pauline is suspiciously already referring to herself as the Viscountess. Well, I think it's time that the ladies of the Shire got acquainted with the uh, new Viscountess. I'm Pauline Constable, wife of the new Viscount. Humphrey sits next to Emma while she's being interrogated. Inspector, is there any point to all these questions? Dude, there's been like two questions, calm down. Emma has to stay on the premises until she's given the okay to leave and... Aww, she's reading her cousin's book! It looks like we get to see a tiny bit of Jess after all. Derek rides in enthusiastically on a horse. Don't you think this is a bit inappropriate? Sorry, Aunt Sybil, can't be helped. Emma is called in to be questioned further, where she explains she used the pickled herring they had last night in her picnic basket. She left it unattended while she got dressed, and they speculate that somebody could have dumped poison on it. The family knew Emma wouldn't eat it since she explained her food poisoning incident. While Emma is talking to the detective, she realizes that Jeffrey's father died in a similar manner, and that someone in the family planned both of these deaths. She also says her cousin, Jess, inspired her to come to this conclusion. The detective is impressed. There is nothing amateurish about your supposition. Nothing whatsoever. Do I suck at my job? Due to this new evidence, the body of Jeffrey's father is exhumed. During this, Humphrey learns that Johnny, this guy, was involved with some shady people and may need money. Emma questions Gwen, his girlfriend, but is interrupted by more strange news. There's been a hunting accident. Young Derek Constable has just been shot. <laughs> what? During this scene, you can see Lansbury knocking over some beer. Clearly an accident, but left in. Meanwhile, nobody knows who shot Derek or why. It seems like a diversion. Emma has an idea of who is behind it all and pretends to leave, which the family is very eager about. She and Humphrey hop in the car to get to the train station, but it won't start. Oh, what a pity. It won't start. It seldom will when you remove the distributor cap. Humphrey asks if he could use Pauline's car, which she is very anxious about. The detective hops onto the site and asks her why her car is suddenly filthy after a car wash, something Emma noticed after Derek was shot, and why she was late for a previous appointment with some members of the Shire. <laughs> the Shire. Sybil is put off by Pauline's hesitance to open the trunk and tells the detective the car is registered in her name, giving him permission to do it himself. Open the boot. Aha! There's boots in her boot! 
Oh, and a gun. That's probably the more important thing. Yes, it was Pauline. She murdered the 17th Viscount, the 18th Viscount, and she shot her son, Derek. You may be wondering, why? She wasn't even in line to be the next lord. Well, it turns out she grew up the daughter of a lowly baker and wanted to be someone more important, so she was determined to be the wife of the next Viscount Black Raven. Social status meant so much to her that she was willing to shoot her own son in the arm and blame it on Johnny as a diversion. She's taken away, and we're bestowed with this amazing freeze frame ending. Have you ever considered uh, becoming a detective? You have a knack for it. Let's just say, yeah. Uh... It runs in the family. <laughs> oh, murder, she wrote. I love you. Right, final thoughts. I adore this episode, even if Jess wasn't in it at all. Lansbury does such a good job portraying the campy, garishly dressed Emma McGill that it didn't feel like a second-rate J.B. Fletcher. It really did feel like a different character altogether. The singing scene is a delight, the actors and actresses were professional and intense, and I never met a murder mystery about a terrible rich family getting their comeuppance that I didn't like. There are 12 seasons of Murder, She Wrote, so you can imagine the same characters and format getting tiresome, but the show always found ways to introduce new characters, new settings, and different plots. I also like the idea of sleuthing skills being prominent in Jess's family, though they didn't seem to pass on to her nephew Grady, who is continually bumbling and in need of help. I wish they had brought back Emma for future episodes because she's really charming and fun to watch, but this one and Sing a Song of Murder from season 2 were her only occurrences. If there is an episode of Murder, She Wrote you are just dying to see me talk about, leave a suggestion in the comments, and until then, happy sleuthing. Hey everyone, thanks for watching my video on Murder, She Wrote. If you enjoyed this one, I have several others, but first I'd like to give a special thanks to my patrons who have helped me keep this channel going. I know times are tough right now, so I am extremely grateful and humble to those who keep supporting my work. Thank you. If you want to see some other Murder, She Wrote breakdowns, here are my suggestions. On the left is the very first Murder, She Wrote episode I did, and on the right is the previous episode I did just before this one. Thank you so much for watching, stay safe, stay comfortable, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.